the defendant and all counsel. Ms. LaViolet, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. I'm going to continue to ask the jurors questions. Please explain why you feel Jody is not manipulative either before or after the killing based on the review of statements and interviews. Based on the information that I have, um, I, I don't see a pattern of manipulation in the way I would define it. Um, I, I haven't seen that uh, in terms of her trying to, uh, I, and I'm not sure exactly what, what this is in reference to, so it's a hard question for me to answer, but um, I think anybody can be manipulative. Um, what I look for are patterns, and I didn't see them in the materials that I read in terms of her relationship with Mr. Alexander, so I, I'm not sure how else to answer that. On the one side, we have demeaning multiple verbal slurs, a slap, a shove, a chokehold, and a lunge perpetrated on Jody. On the other, we have a gunshot to the head, a four inch deep slit throat, and close to 30 stab wounds delivered by Jody to Travis. Is not the perpetrator of the greatest domestic violence, Jody? I think what happened to Mr. Alexander is horrific. Objection, relevance. Sustained. I think that self-defense. Objection, beyond the order, beyond the scope of the question. There's no order of objection. I'm going to sustain the objection. The question is, is not the perpetrator of the greatest domestic violence, Jody? No. In the hypothetical given by Mr. Martinez about it being possible Travis was the one who told Jody he wanted her to leave, if that were true, then isn't it likely Travis never hit her that day? I can only go on the materials that I've read and the materials, by the way, that um, were available to me. And when I look at that, I, you know, I, I don't have face-to-face -face corroboration that he hit her that day. What I have is evidence that as she began to pull away, things escalated. When Jody went to confront Bianca about being with Matt McCartney, can't that be seen as she did it because she was jealous? It could be seen that way. It could be seen that way. The nature of the confrontation didn't seem to be hostile from either Ms. Arias's report or Mr. McCartney's. So in that way, she could have been motivated by jealousy, but the confrontation or the, the talk didn't seem to be hostile. Jody went through Travis's emails, text messages, and his inbox of his MySpace page. Did you take any of that into consideration when making your assessment? Yes, yes I did. Yes, I did. You bought Miss Arias books, apologized upon meeting her, and ordered her a magazine subscription. Did you do anything else to establish a relationship with Jody? Uh, simply talking to her and meeting with her uh, would be the things that I did, spending, spending the hours in jail talking to her, but no, nothing else. I mean, other than the conversation. Have you given her anything else? No, I haven't. Have you ever had any physical contact with her? Hugs, friendly touching, etc. Well, I don't, I don't think so. I might have touched her arm. I don't know. But in, in jail, there's a, a screen or a piece of plexiglass, and you're 
you know, kept from that person, and that was my meetings with, with Miss Arias, other than what you've seen here in court. How do you know Jody received Spider-Man underwear from Travis on Valentine's Day? Did you see them, pictures, or anything else? Um, the only thing I saw was um, the, the um, text message between the two of them where she told him she was bringing the Spider-Man underwear. Um, that's what I saw. How many men have you testified for in criminal court? I haven't testified much in criminal court, um, but how many men? I wrote a report for one man. Sorry, to be honest, how many men has she testified for? Sustained. I haven't testified much, um, so one or two. If you had been given access to everything except interviews with Jody, how would your opinion have varied, if at all? I think that um, I would have, well, I would have come to the same conclusion because part of what I read were interactions uh, between, I read about the interactions between Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander. I read Mr. and Mrs. Hughes' responses. I read the interactions between um, other you know, other women and Mr. Mr. Alexander. I read Mr. Alexander's parts of his journal, um, and I think the first page of his, his uh, MySpace, and uh, I also read the collateral interviews. So those were the things that, even if I hadn't been able to uh, interview Ms. Arias, I would have found sufficient information. Would you have adjusted your belief in the level of abuse? Would you have adjusted your belief in the level of abuse if you had been given access to everything except the interviews with Jody? Um, no, because once again, given my experience, and working with people who are violent and people who have been abusive, the level of psychological abuse, the level of character assassination was incredibly high in that case. And you can have cases where people are just so apprehensive and afraid of what's going to happen because of the escalation in that verbal and uh, emotional abuse. Other than what Jody has told you, in what other sources did you see evidence of physical violence by Travis? I actually didn't see other evidences of physical violence by Travis, other than what Ms. Arias told me. Would your analysis of this relationship change if, hypothetically speaking, you found out that the stories about physical violence and Travis's masturbating to children were made up? I would still rely on what I know about the psychological abuse. And as I've you know, said before, when I've worked with victims of purely psychological abuse, they feel intimidated and afraid and apprehensive and very much put down um, and often say that, that that abuse for them is worse than the physical abuse that they've endured. Regarding nonverbal communication, do you think that you can read through a string of emails, text messages, instant messages between two people and know exactly what the nonverbal communication is? No. How do you know tone, meaning, inside jokes, and or the meaning if you cannot get both sides of the story? Well, there would be no way for me to interview Mr. Alexander, but I read so much of what he put together. And if you look at history, I mean, we take written documentation as evidence of many things. When, we di when we're not able to interview the players in the situation, we have to rely on the, the, written, the written evidence that we have. 
and I had a fair amount of written evidence that I relied on. You said other sources said Jody was not manipulative. Who are these sources? Um, Mr. McCartney um, and Mr. Brewer, who were her uh, previous uh, boyfriends who she had longer term relationships with. And when she was a little older, um, I didn't read about her being manipulative by her uh, sisters or her brother. Um, so there was this period when she was young and a teenager where I would have to say, any of us who've been teenagers know we can be pretty manipulative. But as an adult in her adult relationships, I didn't hear her described that way at all. When interviewing Jody, you claimed you did not ask leading questions. If someone asks a specific question that elicits a simple yes or no response, would you consider that a leading question? Gosh, I've been asked a lot of uh, yes or no questions, and I, I think they're, they're questions. I don't know that they're leading questions. I work very hard not to ask leading questions, but it doesn't mean I haven't. Uh, but it's not my intention to do that, and I try very hard not to do that. You say Travis gives no indication of being stalked, displays no fearful behavior, and continues his contact with Jody of his own accord. How do you reconcile Jody's claim of domestic violence if she continues her contact with Travis of her own accord? Where was her feel fearful behavior? Um, domestic violence and stalking in domestic violence relationships or stalking outside of them tend to be different. What you see most frequently with battered women is that they go back and forth and back and forth and that happens in uh, most of these relationships. We don't see people leave and stay gone. Um, and their fear tends to develop over a longer period of time. With stalking, fear tends to develop um, over a shorter period of time, and the relationship between the stalker, uh, for instance, in domestic violence, when the, the real stalking occurs is usually when the person has totally left the relationship, and there is not a desire for ongoing contact. So the relationship between a stalker and the person they're stalking is different than the relationship between two people who love each other and are not decided on whether to stay or leave. Do you consider someone who says, no jury will ever convict me, to be a person with low self-esteem? It sounds like a really foolish statement to me. I don't know what to say about self-esteem, but it doesn't seem like a, a good statement to make, that's for sure. How can you say that Jody and Travis's relationship was domestic abuse when there is no proof other than name calling on paper and Jody's word? There is, it's the degree of, of name calling, it's the degree of put down, it's the level of escalation, and it's the words of his two closest friends and, and his uh, relationships with other women. Uh, that aren't close, so it's not uh, just from Jody's words or the words on paper between the two of them, but that certainly, I mean, those kind of words, I don't think anyone would want their daughter called those kind of words, and they would be very upset about it. Um, or someone they loved, male or female, called those kind of words. They would see it as abusive, and I don't know anybody in my field who would not see it as abusive. Do you handle cases where the female is the abuser? Yes, I do. Did Travis discuss abuse of Jody or any other women in his journal entries? No, he didn't. In all of the evidence you reviewed, was there any indication anywhere of Travis claiming stalking by anyone else other than Jody? No, I don't believe so. 
of the times you have testified in other cases, how many of these were in defense of men? Not just criminal, but... Um, Overruled. Um, I've, I've also worked in family law. So um, I would say of the 18 times I've testified that I have worked three or four. And defense um, has a broader brush. If I don't know if I can explain that. Uh, OK. Um, what I mean by that is I've had referrals, for instance, uh, for men who have been accused of beating their wives and children. And um, I've worked with the attorney, but we've also worked to get intervention for the person. Sustained. What is the manifesto you referred to during your testimony? I actually don't know because I've never seen it. I, I don't know what somebody Somebody um, said there was a manifesto, but it's nothing I've ever seen. Is there a type of stalking or what could be considered stalking that a person is comfortable around someone in person or when they are speaking with them, but are afraid of what they will do or what they are capable of when they are not around? Um, there's... When you look at abuse and, and lower end battering or battering, there's, there's um, during the pull apart time when people are moving apart, coming back together, um, there's the disbelief from either person that the relationship is going to end. And in that case, they go back and forth together. And there might even be a protective order. They might get together for dinner. Um, that's very common, actually. Uh, the violation of a protective order at the beginning of a case. Um, they, uh, so as, as long as they're still engaged in the relationship to some degree, um, there might be that back and forth, but that's not stalking. Stalking, uh, what you see in domestic violence with stalking is once that stalker knows you mean business, once you're gone, that's when their behavior will escalate and get worse. When speaking of blackmail and being threatened, are you aware that Jody threatened Travis by saying she would let out that he was a pedophile? Um, I was not aware of that. Does that mean anything to you? Yes. Of course it means something to me. Yes. You stated that it would be beneficial for Jody to write things she was lying about in her journal to buck up her story. How would she write about these things in her journal if her story didn't change until well after the killing, hypothetically speaking? If she had planned something, if she had planned on being separated from Travis, um, it seems like she would use, she would be building up a story that would include all of this. Um, I don't see a plan here to separate from Travis and to build a, a domestic violence case. Regarding the text message from Travis to Jody where he is upset about her BS story from Michelle K or Elena, what exactly was the BS story that Jody told Travis? Uh, the, the BS story was that this woman came into the restaurant and told uh, Jody that, that Mr. Alexander was having um, a relationship with Lisa Andrews, which in fact was true. Where did you get this information? Um, well, I got the information, uh, the information about which? The BS story. The information about the BS story um, actually came from looking at the overlap in the communications and what was said uh, with what Miss Arias gave me, but also reading what Lisa Andrews wrote, and she was in fact having a relationship with Mr. Alexander at the time, so it wasn't a BS story. You stated that Travis was the one lying in this message. How do you know this for sure? 
uh, because I read, uh, I read the information from Lisa Andrews. And Lisa Andrews was talking about their relationship at the time. Um, so there was corroboration from Lisa Andrews. How can you know that Jody's BS story was not a lie? Not the subject, but the actual story that was told. I can't. I don't know the actual story that was told to Mr. Alexander. You seem to believe that when the argument began between Jody and Travis prior to the Havasupai trip, when he followed her upstairs, that he only wanted to pursue an argument. How do you know he did not want to get the issue resolved and calm her and may have been embarrassed at her behavior in front of the Freemans? I, I don't know that, and um, I didn't use that heavily in my assessment. Can you explain how Ms. Arias can remember physical abuse incidents so vividly but does not write anything, not even a reference to her feelings, in her journal? About the incidents? About those incidents? I'll read it again. Can you explain how Ms. Arias can remember physical abuse incidents so vividly but does not write anything, not even a reference to her feelings, in the journal? I believe that, um, well, there were different places that she wrote uh, references to her feelings, but um, I can't explain what, what somebody does, but I um, know that people remember things that they don't write down. You testified writings could have supported her statements. However, is it possible the incidents of abuse reported by Jody were, were reported after the fact as a secondary gain to benefit her? That's possible. That's possible. I didn't rely just on her oral or verbal report. Do you have any evidence other than Jody's word that Travis made her tear out pages and write only positive thoughts? No, I don't. Who from Jody's past did you interview that you were able to rule out Jody's manipulative behavior being a pattern? I wasn't able to interview anyone from her past directly. I was given the interviews that were done at the beginning and given all of them to review. So there were, I think, at least 20 collaterals. There were more collateral sources in this case than any case I've ever worked on. You told us at the beginning of your testimony that you like to meet with each individual before analyzing the relationship. We have heard Jody's side of the story. Can you tell us Travis's side of the story? Well, by law, I can't interview. Rule 703, legal opinion. Overruled, you may continue. By law, I can't interview Travis's family. Um, I obviously can't interview Mr. Alexander. Um, I did review um, uh, seven hours of unedited footage uh, regarding Mr. Alexander that um, people spoke very well of him in, in that interview, um, friends of his and his family, and I was able to look at that. Um, I was also able to look at some of the things he did that were very kind and generous and some of the ways that he um, made people laugh and motivated people. Um, so I, I didn't feel for myself that he was a one-dimensional human being at all. I felt that there were very good parts of Mr. Alexander that, um, and I see that with people I work with. You don't hook up and make a relationship with someone who doesn't have lots of good traits. You, you value those traits, and I think Mr. Alexander had some outstanding traits. You mentioned that stalking could fall under the abuse and battering columns in your continuum. If that is true, why is stalking excluded from those columns? Actually, um, because when I do that in training, when I, when I talk about that, I call it um, normal stalking, which 
I kind of described as that period where neither party believes each, each other. I don't believe that um, you're going to leave and you don't believe I'm going to stop hurting you. And so we pull back and forth. And so it is very common, for instance, that if a survivor uh, takes out a protective order, that their partner, because um, it's worked in the past to push on them, believes um, that they can keep pushing. And it's not until the person actually enforces the protective order that they change their mind when they see you mean business. So I discuss it as normal, I call it normal stalking, but it really could be called the pulling away of the relationship. Is your continuum incomplete? Why not list all appropriate bullet points for the appropriate column? Oh my, yes, my continuum is incomplete. <laughs> it is. I, I am messing with it all the time. I've been changing it and messing with it since 1998. I, I don't know how to make it complete unless I were to do, it would look like the Dead Sea Scroll. It would be so thick and I just don't have, um, I just kind of have it as a framework for people to look at and uh, there are other people who go into more detail than I do, but there are people that go into less detail than I do who, who do this work. So, uh, yes, it's incomplete. You stated that you have chosen not to take cases in the past because you did not believe an individual. Did you take this case in part because you believed Jody? Yes. If you did not believe her, would you have chosen to turn it down? Yes. If you start out believing in an individual, doesn't that, by default, set up prejudices toward their partner? Uh, no, because I have had cases where, as I pursue them, uh, I have found that I do not uh, find this credible, and I have talked to the attorneys. I mean, what I say to people at the beginning of a case is, I can investigate this, and if I don't believe it, I'm not going to testify. If I don't find enough credible evidence, I'm not going to testify. So, so I have, you know, been involved in cases where I drop them or, you know, advise the attorney or maybe I'm not the appropriate um, expert. Maybe they need an expert in something other than domestic violence uh, in this case, and so uh, maybe they need somebody in drug abuse, and then I'll refer them to somebody I think might be good. But I don't have a great retirement after 34 years. But Sustained. You stated that regarding anger, it is more common for someone to have a burst of anger than calm down. Is it possible that Travis's rants seem longer because they are being viewed in text form? Actually... Um, they go on over a period, I believe, of two to three hours, which is pretty long, and then followed up with the other. Objection, lack of foundation. Sustained. Pardon? General. Well, continue with your response. Um, there were long rants um, that uh, the longest one I'm thinking of is like um, two to three hours. Overruled. You may continue. Um, it was the, uh, I think it was the 526, but the detail, the date, is not as important to me as the context of what's happening um, and the, the general framework of the, of the um, rant, but uh, there was a follow-up. There was a text message, and then, as I said, I get these things mixed up, the IMs and the text. But there was, this went on for uh, another, I think, uh, it says when it started, um, and I think it went on for 16 pages or something like that. So it, it's an extensive length of time. Can you explain what you mean by a burst of anger? Could a 10 or 20 minute rant be described as a burst? A 10 or 20 minute rant could be described as a burst what you would look at is what happens during that 10 or 20 minute. You know, when I, when I work with somebody who's um, 
you know, breaking things and throwing things in a 10 or 20 minute burst. It's different than somebody who's storming around the house or muttering under their breath. So you look at the quality of what's happening, not just the burst. If a couple has an argument that takes all day to end, can they still be in a healthy relationship? Yes, absolutely. Would that type of, would that type of argument indicate abuse? It wouldn't have to indicate abuse at all, no. Is it possible for two people to be abusive to each other? Yes. Don't you believe that Travis making comments about a 12-year-old girl while having a phone sex conversation with Jody is fundamentally different than Travis allegedly masturbating to photos of young boys? I think it's different. It's just an unusual comment to make from a 30-year-old man about a 12-year-old girl. Would you characterize your knowledge of June 4, 2008 as light or incomplete? I think some of the detail of like where something happened, I'm, I'm clearer on it now, but I, I knew in general what happened. I was um, focused on what led up to June 4th and then what happened June 4th, and I think I know enough about what happened June 4th. Are you confused on any of the details of that afternoon? Well, I was. I said that, that um, I believe that the shot was fired in the, in the closet, and it wasn't. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm confused about anything else about that or not, but I think I know most of the, the detail. Do you think it is deceptive for someone to not share the most private and intimate details of their lives, like their sexual activities, with their friends and family, or would you consider it normal to keep those things private? I think most people keep the details of their sexual lives private. If normal, why do you think Travis's attempts to keep those things private is deceptive? I don't think him keeping his private life, uh, his sexual life private is deceptive. I think putting himself out as someone who obeys the laws of chastity and is a 30-year-old virgin is deceptive. Did you ever see evidence that Jody was openly sharing all of her most private sexual details with her friends and family? No, I didn't. Would you consider that deceptive? No, I, I don't. I, she never claimed to be a virgin. She never put herself out in that way, although certainly she was part of the Mormon faith and, and not going along with the laws of chastity. You say Jody's lies started after she killed Travis. How could you possibly know this? I can only go on the reports of people in her life prior to that. And once again, primarily the two men that she spent most of her adult, you know, her, her 20s with. Um, and that would be Matt McCartney and Daryl Brewer, neither of whom described her as a liar. Do you believe that Jody was subjected to sexual degradation at the hands of Travis? I believe she participated in that relationship. I believe that she went along with things. Some of things uh, of the things may not have been her favorite things to go along with, and I believe that she wanted to be in that relationship and went further than she should and didn't honor her own boundaries. You stated that you saw no signs of Travis feeling or experiencing sexual degradation at the hands of Jody. Noting his desire to see Jody in California, his actions on the sex call, and comments in various texts, instant messages, etc. 
Couldn't that same argument be made regarding Jody's alleged sexual degradation given her desire to see Travis, her actions on the sex call, and various comments in instant messages, texts, etc.? Yes, I, I've not heard, uh, actually, I've not heard Jody say that she felt sexually degraded and humiliated. I have not heard her, to me, I have not heard her testimony, so I don't know what was said there. But um, she has not made claims in that direction. If you were to only consider the written conversations and journals, excluding your interview with Jody, did you see abuse? Please explain. If I were to ex exclude the... If you were to only consider the written conversations and journals, excluding your interview with Jody, did you see abuse? Please explain. I'm, I'm confused by that. I'm, I'm thinking that um, it's about Jody's journal and my interviews with Jody. If I excluded those things and still used the rest of the written um, documentation that I got, I would still see that as abuse. What level or degree would you place that abuse? Um, I think the verbal abuse was uh, in battering. I don't think it was in, uh, I don't think it was in abuse. Um, I don't think it uh, elevated to some of the things I've seen in terrorism. It was definitely battering. Considering only the written conversations and journals, can you say you saw an escalation? The written conversation between Mr. Alexander and, and Ms. Arias? Correct. Um, oh yeah, I saw an escalation. You saw it over time. The, um, the rants got longer, the uh, put downs got worse, um, the anger, him talking about his own anger and being, you know, seeing it as scary, that, that was all in there. You mentioned Travis was in a seven year relationship with Deanna. Are you aware of anyone interviewing her to determine if she was a victim or survivor? I don't know um, if anyone interviewed Deanna. I didn't see anything um, that indicated that she was a survivor of abuse. Did you interview her? No, I did not. All right, it looks like we have some additional juror questions in the basket. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any other questions for this witness? If so, please submit them now. Council, please approach.
You keep saying that Jody does not match your definition of manipulative. Is it possible that your definition of manipulation differs from others? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it possible that your definition is wrong? Sure. Yesterday, you were asked about Jody being an abuser toward her mother, and you stated it was normal teenage behavior. Do you honestly believe that hitting and kicking your parents are normal behavior at any age? No, I don't believe I said it was normal teenage behavior. I said it was not appropriate teenage behavior, um, but it is behavior that teenagers do. Um, do I think it's good behavior? No, I don't think it's good behavior. No other questions? Follow up? Ms. Wilmot. Good morning, Ms. Violet. Good morning, Ms. Wilmot. Actually, let me just start where, you, where we just left off about normal teenage behavior. Uh, the, when we're, and the question with regard to manipulation. So when we're talking about teenage behavior, something that occurs as a teen, kicking, kicking your mother, that's, I just heard you say that's not a good thing. Right. When we talk about someone doing that as a teenager, does that necessarily and mandatorily mean that the person grows up and becomes an abuser of her boyfriend? No. And from the time that she was a teenager to the time that she's an adult, and I'm talking about Miss Arias, do you see any other behavior that is, that is um, abusive to anyone else? No, I don't. And so when you're taking into account the fact that there was issues with her mother as a teenager, do you also take into account the years and decades that went by from that point to the point that we are now, and to her point with um, her relationship with Mr. Alexander? I said, do you? Um, do, do you take into account the fact that, there are de that there's a decade between, more than a decade, between the time of, of an issue with her mother to the time that she's in a relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yes, I do. And so if there's no patterns between that time, patterns of abuse with other people or any pattern of abuse with regard to Mr. Alexander, is that important to you? Yes, it's very important to me. And in any way, does that mean that you condone her behavior as a teenager? No, I don't condone her behavior as a teenager. And speaking of when she was a teenager, are you also aware of the fact that her mother hit her? Yes, I am. And so if, if there was this, uh, if, there, if her mother was hitting her, which has not been discussed as much, but if her mother's hitting her and then we hear that she um, hit her mother, does that add to the understanding, perhaps, of how she acted as a teenager? It, it could, yes. You answered the question about whether or not your idea of manipulation could possibly differ from others and whether or not it would be wrong. Have you worked in your time uh, as a therapist? Have you worked with people who are manipulative? Yes. And have you worked with people who might try to manipulate you? Yes. And yesterday, I believe you testified about working with people who are trying to um, build a story of domestic violence. Correct. And when you see people trying to build a story of domestic violence with you, is that a form of manipulation? I find it a form of manipulation. Manipulation. Okay. And so would that, would that fall under your definition of manipulation? Somebody trying to weave a story to get me to buy into it? Yes. Yes, it would fall under my uh, definition of, domestic, er, of uh, manipulation. Okay, and did you see any type of evidence that Jody was doing that to you? No, I did not. And in fact, as you have said numerous times, did you rely on uh, information to this case in your assessment far beyond what Ms. Arias told you? Yes. And when you're talking about manipulation, are you talking about if you were to look at uh, manipulation as re with regard to uh, domestic violence relationship, do you look at one incident of manipulation or do you look at patterns? In domestic violence, I look at patterns when I'm looking at anything. Okay. And did you see any patterns of manipulation from Jody to Mr. Alexander? No, I did not. Uh, 
you, there was questions about uh, whether or not you found Miss Arias to be sexually degraded. You remember talking about uh, remember talking about that just a few minutes ago? Yes. Okay. looks like by now, right? And I know you do, right? Yes. Okay. And so in your continuum, it, does it list stalking just under terrorizing? Yes. And the, um, and it also under terrorizing, does it list sexual degradation? Yes. Uh, did you, what did you ultimately conclude with regard to the domestically violent relationship between Jody and Mr. Alexander? Was it terrorizing? Was it battering? Abuse? What was it? It was more battering. Okay. And so in order to get into battering, do you need to have sexual degradation? No. And did you find any sexual degradation with regard to Jody? It seemed that they were both involved in a sexual relationship. Okay. And at some point, um, you were asked about... Uh, uh, with regard to the sexual degradation, there's... You had previously said about there, a saying about men give love to get sex and women give sex to get love. Yes. Does that count as sexual degradation? No. Okay. Uh, is that something that you saw going on here with Jody as far as what she was doing for Travis or Mr. Alexander? Yes. Uh, did you find any writings or anything that, you, that, that supports the fact that Miss Miss Arias... Um, wanted to participate in sexual activities with Mr. Alexander because it brought them closer. Yes, I did. There was, a, there was um, I believe it was part of the 526 uh, conversation where she said, where she indicated that, that um, she could feel closer to him and feel like the relationship was more significant um, when they were sexual and that when they were sexual, he treated her differently um, he was sweet to her. He, um, he seemed to value her, and they had more time together. And that was important to her. And that she said, um, you know, I was a whore for those feelings. I wanted those feelings that we had when we were together. And is this all part of the conversation where Mr. Alexander was calling her a whore as well? Yes. With regard to those to, to that particular um, conversation and conversations prior to it, and when I say conversations, I mean in written form, right? Uh, you were asked questions about character assassination, and isn't that just name calling? Right. Do you remember that? Yes. So, in particular, on May twenty on uh, May twenty sixth, the conversation that goes on and on, and we know, I, I don't believe. Do you know the time of how long that conversation took place with regard to the instant messaging? I get mixed up, but I think that's the one that's about two to three hours. I, I think that's the one. I'm not sure. I'm, okay. I'm not sure what's the instant me message and what's the text. Okay. Instant messaging is the one that has the line after line after line, and the text messages are the one that have boxes. So the one that has line after line, is that about 16 or 18 pages? Oh. Yes. Okay. And so in that conversation, is that the conversation where you see character assassination? Yes, I see character assassination. And where is Mr. Alexander talking to her, telling her that she's a corrupted carcass? Yes. And calling her a whore? Yes. And a slut? Yes. Does, she call, does he call her names like bitch? Yes. And more so with regard, when we're talking about going, moving from name calling to character assassination, is, what, what is the difference between the two? Why, is, why are some of these things considered character assassination for you? Well, part of the reason they're considered character assassination is they go beyond bitch. They go on to calling somebody a slut, a three-hole wonder, uh, someone who has, doesn't have the conscience of Adolf Hitler, um, someone who uh, should get tips uh, because of her job for uh, giving blowjobs. Somebody, I mean, it's actually, it's putting down who the person is. 
And that is absolutely, I mean, it's assassination of the soul, if you want to look at it that way. It's, it's, it tears apart who you are. It's not just, and I think that would be true for men or women, that to be called names by somebody you love and to be torn apart in that way is so destructive to your character. And is it different when you are called these horrible names by someone you love versus the public calling you names? Is that, is that different? Yes, it is. How is it different? Because the public doesn't know who you are. Uh, well, hopefully, the yeah. public that's calling you names uh, is generic and doesn't know who you are. The person who loves you knows who you are. There's a bond of trust, generally speaking, there. And it's the person that you want to think um, thinks you're the most special person on the world in the world. So when they tear you apart, it's it's so painful. Okay. Um, you were asked questions about um, uh, about the comment that Mr. Alexander makes uh, in the phone sex tape about uh, Miss Aria sounding like a twelve year old girl. Yes. Uh, and how hot that was, right? Yes. Regardless of whether or not he spoke of a girl or whether he was masturbating to pictures of little boys, either way, aren't both of them considered children? They are considered children. With regard to your continuum, the fact that you didn't write or list the name stalking under battering and abusive, does that make your continuum incomplete? Well, I just don't have room for everything on my continuum. And I, and I need to explain to people what I mean by the kind of stalking that can happen in abuse and battering. Okay. And is that, some, is that a different kind of stalking then than what you see under terrorizing? Yes. Or very high on battering. Or very high. Okay. You were asked a question about uh, what, how it would be possible for Jody to remember the physical abuse, even though she doesn't write it down. And I believe your answer was something to the effect of that people can remember things even when they don't write them down. Yes. Uh, is, is being smacked around, is that something, or being strangled, is that something that might be memorable to people? Yes, uh, What would, our probe, please. Violet, the question that I asked you was, um, <laughs> what, um, talking about, oh, okay. 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, please remember the admonition. 10 minutes, thank you, you are excused. jury has left the courtroom, we are at recess.